This is Game On, discussing the biggest games and all the latest sports news with Johnny Montabano and Hank and Dichter on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Time, folks. It's episode 25 of Game On here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. I'm Johnny Montabano, joined by Hank and Dichter. Hank, welcome. How are you? Doing pretty good. So happy that for once I can enjoy week one after a Giants victory. It has felt like forever, but you know what? I'm sure we will be talking more about that as the show goes on look it don't get me wrong i'm not saying this is a team that's going to go on to win the super bowl but come on one or no feels pretty good especially because the giants have not been over 500 since the day odell beckham and victor cruz decided to join the beach boys <laughs> yeah i don't i don't think we should be apologizing for uh being one to know and maybe overreacting a little bit to the win i mean look a win is a win no matter how you get it and yeah, the Giants haven't been above 500 since 2016, which is just crazy to think about it. Not had a win uh, one week once since 2016, and I've been above 500 forever, it feels like. But, yeah, that was a nice game, and we will get to that, and we're going to get to a lot of stuff over the course of the show. And, uh, folks, just uh, full disclosure, you're just going to have to bear with me today. Um, allergy season has started down here in South Carolina, and you could probably tell my voice. I mean, I am very, very raspy. I, I, there's a few reasons between allergies and a lot of the topics that we're going to get to over the course of the episode and why I'm dealing with a little bit of a raspy voice, but I'm here uh, and we will get through it together. But uh, Hank, like you said, we got a lot to, uh, we got the giant stuff to get to and a lot of other things to get to over the course of the show. And we want to hear from you folks as well. So feel free to uh, shoot us a message over and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash game on ETB on Twitter at game on ETB and also on our Instagram account game on underscore ETB and our personal handles, which are scrolling there on the bottom of your screen. So Hank, like you said, we've got a lot to get to with week one of the NFL season now officially in the books and we can already start turning the page to week two. And I'll tell you when the way you think about it this week, this year is going to fly by. It, it does every year in football season. And it just seems like every year it goes by quicker and quicker, even though they added another week. Uh, we were going to get to that, you know, college football is already in its third week upcoming, which is just crazy. We've got a lot to look back at week two. And one of the reasons why I'm dealing with this raspy voice is because of my Notre Dame fighting, fighting Irish, which did not put up much of a fight against Marshall. We're going to get to that. We also have some baseball talk as the season's coming down the stretch there. Uh, and once again, though, we're talking about more problems with baseball, these new rule changes, which are officially going to be put into effect starting in 2023. Yet again, another reason with my voice, but we will get to that and so much more. But, Hank, let's uh, dive into week one here of the NFL season and – Really, when you look at week one, I think the biggest storyline that you get coming out of it is the injury to Dallas Cowboys quarterback, Dak Prescott. Now, the initial diagnosis was an injury to his thumb, and they were saying six to eight weeks. Well, Jerry Jones went on 105.3 The Fan on Tuesday morning and announced that they're looking at possibly he could be back sooner than that initial time frame, and they're looking at possibly four weeks. So they're not going to put him on the injured reserve list, and they're also not going to put – they're not going to go out and get another quarterback to fill the need. So if you're a Cowboys fan, not only do you come off that really tough loss on Sunday when you're the only team in the NFL to not score a touchdown, but now you've got an injury to Prescott, which could be lingering throughout the season. Uh, you don't really have a lot of other capable options. Cooper Rush looks like he's going to be inserted into there, and – Really, I mean, not only is it that, but even when Dak was playing on Sunday, Hank, they just couldn't get any offense going. And this was one of the major concerns that I had going with the Cowboys going into the season was the injury to Smith, now the injury to Prescott. You know, they lose Amari Cooper. They get rid of him. They don't really have many options on offense outside of Zeke. Uh, defensively, you know, they've still got Diggs, who had 11 uh, interceptions last year, but they're not really that deep at any of the positions. And now with Dak being out for at least four weeks, uh, this 
I think, you know, you don't want to have overreaction after week one, but I'm going to go out and, and say it right now, and you can clip this. To me, the Dallas Cowboys are done. You know, if, if they're not going to score when Dak was even in there and now he's going to be out, they, to me, they're going to have a lot of problems this season. That is not an opinion that I think to be far-fetched. I mean, when you're the only team, and by the way, this is a hanky fun fact that I am very happy to gloat about. When you're the only team that has not scored a touchdown during week one, I don't care that it's against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady. That's a problem, and yours truly is not looking so good for having taken Dak Prescott early on in his fantasy draft, but you know what? That's okay because at least I have Matt Stafford as my backup, so my team's pretty loaded, but aside from that, yeah, no. If you're going to have to rely on Cooper Rush for the next two to three weeks, I don't think that's a great alternative. No, and there are two names that have been reported a lot in trade talks, and I was thinking about this more and more after the injury to Dak on Sunday night. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo out there with the 49ers and Tyler Huntley from the Baltimore Ravens. And I don't really know if it see the reason why I, I those names come up, obviously, but I don't know they're going to be good fits for the Cowboys because to me, I don't think the Cowboys have much of an offense to begin with. And that's why I didn't really like them winning this division at the start. And I think Dak would have had to play like an MVP caliber just to take the Cowboys above the Eagles. And now without him being there, it, what this really does now is it's going to put a ton of pressure on Ezekiel Elliott to return to form here going forward. And one of the other problems that the Cowboys are going to have, let's just say Dak's going to be out for at least, the, let's just say he's out for only four weeks, which I, I mean, I think he's, I think Jerry Jones who announced this on 105.3, the fan, said four weeks, and I think he's being a little bit too optimistic. But let's just say that's the case. Here's their schedule in those in that four weeks time frame. The Bengals, who just who we're going to get to in a moment here, who came off a bad loss to the Steelers. The Giants, who at MetLife Stadium, who right now look like they will have some life and could be, you know, we'll see. I mean, again, not want to overreact, but that all of a sudden becomes kind of a favorable matchup for the Giants. Uh, the Commanders at home, which maybe they could pull off the win against Washington, and then they travel to and then they travel to take on the Rams in Week Five. I'm that looking at that right now, and if guess. they pull, if they somehow get two and two in that stretch, that would be amazing. But that's the thing too, and this is why I think the Cowboys are in real big trouble, and why I would not be afraid to say that they're done. If Dak was out six to eight weeks. After those four games, right, this is leading up to their bye week, they're at Philadelphia, home to the Lions, home to the Bears, and then they hit their bye week. So the, the last two weeks before their bye week are kind of favorable, but then again, what are the Cowboys? So if Dak's only out four weeks and he comes back, returns to form, maybe you have a chance to get into that wild card spot. But just going off of what how they played before the injury against the, the Bucks. You can't you can't be too overly thrilled right now with the Cowboys. And I want to remind you about the series of events that led up to this, just to reinforce your belief that they're done. You traded away Amari Cooper for pennies on the dollar, and mind you, they traded him literally right before the Christian Kirk signing. So they could have gotten a lot more for him in return, but well. They played themselves. And then, you know, they lost a good amount of their depth. You had the Tyron Smith injury. And you somehow, but yet out of all the receivers, you kept Michael Gallup for reasons. So, yeah, no. All that plus the DAC injury, I don't think they're going anywhere this year. They are screwed. And I'm sorry, I needed to quote Stephen A for you. They will actually know. Are they an accident waiting to happen? Because maybe they already went through that accident. <laughs> yeah, and if you look ahead to their week two game against the Bengals here, 
they've got two more starters that are out. Left guard Connor McGovern, who suffered a high ankle sprain on the opening drive against Tampa Bay, and safety Gerard Curse, who sprained his knee in the second half. So they are dealing with uh, already multiple injuries to start. Their receiving core didn't really do much in that opening game. I and mean, there, there really was nothing that you could take out of that first game against uh, the Tampa, against Tampa Bay and be thrilled about. And now you go to take on a Bengals team, which is going to be thirsty after a, a bad loss and the way they played against the Steelers. It, it's not looking too good down there in Dallas, that's for sure. And I'd still be very, very skeptical about Dak only being out four weeks. I understand the surgery was successful and stuff, but, I mean – yeah, it's, it's hard to see it come back. And this is the thing now with Dak. You know, his first few years in the league, he played every game, and now he's dealt with obviously that, that ankle injury. Last year he had a calf strain. Now he's got a thumb injury. And so it's uh, challenging times down there in Dallas. That's that's for sure. And I just don't see how they're gonna, even right now they're going to be able to overtake the Eagles uh, in that division. It's uh, Right now you got to try and get some way to get back into a wild card discussion and – Without, you know, Dak, I don't see how they can survive. I don't, I don't know what Cooper Rush really is, and I think you really got to have to get Ezekiel Elliott uh, a lot more touches and a lot more carries, and he's going to have to be the bulk of your offense here going forward without Dak. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think the Eagles. Well, I mean, you know, we know what happened in the second half of that game against the Lions. Lions almost made a game of it, although. Help me in, in our little picks contest, but that's beside yeah. the point. It's okay. I definitely think the Eagles, even though I'm still not quite as high on Jalen Hurts, I think that's definitely the better roster than the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, like you said, schedule doesn't get easier. I think they're, the hope for them is little to none, and they have to hope that they can, you know, make up a lot of those games in the second half, assuming – that they struggle without Dak, you know, for as long as Jerry Jones says he's going to be out. So, yeah, yep. well, yeah, we'll find out. And like I said, even if they were able to go out there and get like a Garoppolo or a Tyler Huntley or any other quarterback, their offense was so in shambles on Sunday. I don't, I don't even know if they would be able to solve the problem that they really have. That's, that's it. And this just adds on to it, but. We'll find out. They'll take on the Bengals on Sunday in week number two, and we will make our official week two, full week two picks against the spread this coming Friday here on the Empty the Bench podcast network. But, Hank, let's talk about the entire opening week in general here. It really started Thursday night, first game of the season, and the Buffalo Bills, to me, made an absolute statement opening night, beating the uh, Rams 31-10 to uh, as the as L.A. Uh, celebrated their Super Bowl victory. And really, when you look at that, I mean, this was a game to me, even though it was tied at 10 at halftime, this was really a full, complete 60-minute domination for the Buffalo Bills. I mean, Josh Allen was nearly perfect in the first half. A couple of interceptions that were not really his fault. You know, you and I as Giant fans, we've seen a lot of Eli Manning interceptions that were really not his fault. And even though the game was tied at 10 at halftime, I think you had to feel very, very confident the Bills were going to, you know, pull away into the second half. It was They totally did. So the Bills, to me, made a statement opening uh, opening night. Well, I thought maybe af- after the end of the first half, after the Rams tied it, I thought maybe they were going to have the momentum. But then any thoughts you had about that or any any moments where you thought that the Rams had a chance of winning that game pretty much went a- away immediately in the third quarter because their first possession goes nowhere. They have to punt it away. And then... Bill scored the touchdown. That was a seven yard pass to Isaiah McKenzie. And then from there on out, game over. Complete yeah. domination. Josh Allen was absolutely fantastic. I think they had a long drive where he had that 47 yard pass to Davis. And then he ends up scrambling for a four yard touchdown to finish off that drive. And, you know, from there, it was just all Bills. And let me just say imagine if those, imagine if those fluky interceptions didn't happen. 3110, I feel like doesn't like completely tell you the whole story of what happened. I think this was just an an absolute beatdown. And I think it reinforced my belief that the Buffalo Bills are a legitimate threat in the AFC to to go to and possibly win the Super Bowl. 
Yeah, and I'm going to get to this with Burrow too, but there's something with, I think Stafford, there was one thing you noticed with Stafford. I'm going to get to that mm -hmm. in a moment. But yeah, Bill's bold opening opening win there against mm -hmm. the against the Rams. You had the you had the Saints get past barely get past the Falcons 27-26 and there was a a meme on uh, social media uh from about the Falcons and how many big leads and leads they've had that they were not oh able to hold gosh. on here. But uh you know, the Saints come back uh from a big deficit and actually it was kind of amazing to see that the Falcons were even able to put up 26 points. You know, I I've said, I think the Falcons are the worst team in the league this year because not only with Marcus Mario starting, but look how much they've lost, you know, Calvin Ridley out for the season, Russell Gage went to Tampa. Uh, I know Drake London had some moments in that game, but yeah, saints with a, a good comeback and a team that could very well be a very interesting uh, team in the, in the NFC for sure. Uh, Cleveland got past Carolina 26 to 24. This was weird because, you know, be down here in South Carolina, I was watching most of this one too. This was really all Browns early on and Carolina actually still was able to come back second half, even had the lead at one point. It took a 58 yard field goal at, as time expired for the Browns to get a win. And that's a bad loss. If you're the Carolina Panthers, you know, you wanted to see Baker Mayfield and Christian McCaffrey who had a couple of moments on Sunday, but you really wanted to see them come out strong makes me a little bit worried as they go to play on the, the play the Giants on Sunday. But, you know, the Browns, to me, not going to be a good team, but they were able to pull that one out. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that um, this was a game I was expecting Carolina to definitely win, especially with the whole Baker Mayfield redemption arc happening. But that somehow didn't happen. You had that crazy ending of the game with the field goal. And I want to get back to the – to the Saints game. I thought yeah. I was like, so I was on like a long car drive. So I didn't necessarily get to watch the games as, as they were happening. I was like keeping track of it with the radio and on different stops on my phone. I was like very shocked to see the Falcons getting a blowout with this game. But then Saints ended up coming back. And once I saw that, I was like, ah, not surprised. Typical Falcons uh, choke job. And then that you had the Bears game that was played in like what was it monsoon like conditions? I that was another game that was really shocking to see a good comeback win for the Bears, but a very bad loss for a San Francisco 49ers team that like looked to me like one of the few teams that could really challenge the Los Angeles Rams for maybe not just the division but the uh, NFC, the NFC championship. And then this game was one that really stuck out to me. You had the Steelers against the Bengals, and this was a game that, in my opinion, as great of a win as it was for the Steelers, and you have to give them credit for getting the win the way they did, and we know that Joe Burrow did not have one of his better games. In fact, I think he threw, like, what, four picks in the first half? Four interceptions, and he had another turnover. Yeah, and a turnover late, yes. The crazy part was, in spite of all that, the Bengals almost came back and won that game. And in fact, they probably should have won that game, but Evan McPherson ended up missing a lot of big field goals. However, that wasn't the thing that stuck out to me. What stuck out to me in that game was one of the dumbest play calling decisions, like near the end of overtime that I've ever seen, because ordinarily, well, there were two bad moments. First off, it was like, what? Let me, I think it was like third down the, the, Bengals were like entering field goal range. It was, it, they were at like what the 50 yard line or something. Joe Burrow ends up getting sacked. And then why you would even have him throw the ball, especially when you consider the fact that the offensive line wasn't really good in that game for the Bengals. I don't know, but they, essentially they took the risk and they ended up losing good, the field goal range. And then when the punt happened, rather the clock was ticking. Rather than, like, let the clock run out and play for a tie, which really was the only thing that they could do at that point, they just straight up punted the ball and gave the Steelers, like, a little over a minute left to win the game. That's way too much time. And, yeah. look, if the if they had taken – and even if they had taken the penalty, nobody in Cincinnati would be complaining because chances are Mitch Trubisky has the ball back. There's, like, what, 45, 40 seconds remaining – you're not feeling nervous that he's going to go down the field and kick a field goal with less time. But now they have like a little over a minute left. He takes them down. 
Chris Boswell kicks a 53 yard field goal and the Bengals essentially like threw away what would have been a game they probably should have had. Well, it's, it's crazy. You know, a couple of things I take out of that. Number one, Mitch Trubisky played actually pretty well Mm -hmm. on Sunday. I think you got to like that as a Steelers fan. You know, he's somebody that I had said that if he plays well enough and you want to make that change to uh, you want to make that change at quarterback, you could look at him possibly as a trade candidate. You know, there are going to be quarterbacks that are going to get hurt. There are going to be teams looking for either a starter or maybe even as somebody as a backup. And I think if you wanted to transition over from Trubisky to Kenny Pickett, I think you could possibly do that. Uh, Minka Fitzpatrick played well. You know, the injury to TJ Watt, which right now they're reporting may not, may not be, he's going for further testing, but as of Tuesday, they were reporting that he could only be out a few weeks and may not need surgery and it may not be a season ender. You know, it was kind of a costly win for the Steelers. They were able to get the win, but they had injuries to uh, TJ Watt, almost could be season ending, but now it looks like he'll be all right. And Najee Harris, although he was on the Adam Shine show on Sirius XM and said that he's looked like he will be playing on Sunday. So that's good news there. Yeah, there's two things I also take out of it from the Cincinnati Bengals side. And you mentioned one of them, the offensive line. It looked like they were they shorted up in the offseason, but did not play well at all. Burrow was in a lot of trouble all game. And Burrow, I believe, you know, I look at Burrow and him and, and Matt Stafford, to me, prove a point here. They were they both did not really play in the preseason. You know, Burrow towards the uh, towards the beginning of the preseason had that appendectomy, so he was out for a while. And Burrow was dealing with elbow problems that you heard Sean McVay talk about maybe being chronic and stuff. But he had an operation and came through it all right. But you know, you don't get many you don't get reps in the preseason. It's one thing to do it in training camp and stuff, and then maybe not to even have any. And I think that kind of affected both how Burrow played and how Stafford played. And that's why, you know, kind of dumb on my part. You know, there's two picks when we did our pick segment when we went to Sunday, when the game started on Sunday that I wanted to have back. And that was the Bengals when they were favored by six and a half. And that was what you mentioned also, the 49ers getting favored by seven and a weather environment that was just awful for football there in Chicago. But, yeah, but I think if Burrow's going to, you know, a week old now, I think he's going to bounce back. And I think he's in a good spot to go to do it down there in, in, in Dallas. So, Kind of a – and it was crazy, though, because as much as Burrow and the Bengals look bad, like you said, they've had multiple chances to win that game on Sunday. Pretty cr- pretty crazy when you think about it. But, you know, good start for Pittsburgh, who could be a very interesting team in the in the AFC uh, Central there. Uh, you know, they could I, – I always – I still think they're an eight or a nine win team, even if they do make the transition over from Trubisky to uh, Kenny Pickett. But, you know, a good win for them on Sunday. You had the Eagles get past the Lions 38-35. Jalen Hurts looked great. Defense not late. And, you know, if you uh, pick the Eagles at minus the four or four and a half, depending on where you got it from. It's a very unfortunate late cover there. Good good call by you because you actually had a bold pick there thinking the Lions could have won that game outright, and they mm-hmm. almost did. Yeah, no, I, I'm one of those people that watched the Detroit Lions with hard knocks and Based on, you know, how this game ended with the Lions fighting their way back, you could you could also say that maybe that was a case of the Eagles playing like prevent defense or something or sitting on their lead. But at the same time, an attempt at a comeback like that isn't something you've really seen out of the Lions before the Dan Campbell era. So I think he's definitely trying to change the culture there. However, Looking at the roster, obviously it's not great. I'm still not 100% sure that the Lions are a team that, like, would be a playoff team. But, like, I definitely like the heart that they showed in that game. And I had a feeling something like that was going to happen. And that was why I was bold enough to take the Lions. Now, unfortunately for me, they didn't win. And I'm not saying that just because they played against my most hated team. But, like, (laughs) fact of the matter is coming back and, like, putting a really big scare into a team that a lot of people had being – very good. I think that's definitely huge for their confidence. And then you had the that Colts Texans game. On the other hand, the tie there was simply unexpected. Yeah, and even the whole game was really going into the fourth quarter. The Texans are up twenty to three, and you're like, wow. You know, the Texans really, when you look at it, a team that's totally in rebuild mode down there, and Lovey Smith down there actually uh, looks like he has a chance to win it. It took a ferocious fourth quarter rally just to get to overtime. And one of the stories of week one, all the missed kicks, we saw that in overtime with the 
on the Colts side of things, and it ends up being in a 20 to 20 tie. Yeah, I almost unfortunate for the uh, well, depending on how the way you look at it, Colts mm-hmm. were able to come back and force overtime. But I mean, they're, they're better than the than the Texans. I mean, they should not have even been to that point. But you give the Texans credit for at least being up that big. But I think you're seeing why they're really not going to be that good of a team because to blow a 17 point lead like that and force it into overtime and lucky to end in a tie just goes to show you that the amount of work they have to do down there in Houston. Yeah, absolutely. And then you had the uh, Miami Dolphins beating up on the New England Patriots 20 to seven and Patriots got a pretty big injury scare too with uh, Mac Jones. Although in this game, I think if you're a Dolphins fan, you had to like what you got, you saw out of Tua early on with, especially with the new system and his new set of wide receivers. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it looks like Max Mac Jones is going to be all right. But I watched that game from the Patriots side, and that is why my bold prediction, and of course the Jets are not going to help with that, and we're going to get to them in just a moment here. But I think that's why the, the Patriots could be the worst team in this division. There, there's a lot there that you could not like in that opening game. And I know Belichick tried to change the uh, change the tempo and change the idea of, of flying them down the Tuesday before the game, and it just didn't work out, you know. He's trying to do that because in years past they go down to, to Miami and they lose them. But the only difference was the Patriots were a much better team than the Dolphins back in the day. Now it's the roles are reversed. It's the Dolphins that are the much better team. But yeah, it's gonna be a long it's gonna be a rare long year up there in Foxborough for the Patriots. And if it wasn't for the Jets, I, I really believe that the Patriots could be the worst team in this division. And speaking of the Jets, that was just ugly, you know. The, they packed the stadium. Cool moment before the game as they were honoring, of course, 9 11. And they I'm just sorry. Weren't... I need to make a comment that Nick said to us, like off stage yesterday. Yeah. Too bad they couldn't buy points. points, And too bad this isn't really Wheel of Fortune because they couldn't really buy any points this game. Yeah. yeah no. I, well, you know, you want to buy points, you know, start, start Mike White. And we're going to get. Don't start the arm punt who's probably washed at this point. I don't I don't get what they're doing over there. Uh, the Jets have some talent that they're going to be competitive, but when they decided to start Joe Flacco, it's like they just basically said they don't want to win this game. And Lamar Jackson who gave himself a gave them a Friday deadline to get a contract extension, it did not work out. And then the reports come out that he want that the contract that was offered, he wants fully guaranteed like Deshaun Watson. But he goes out there and they went. They beat the Jets twenty-four to nine. Not a lot of things you could not like though from the Jets. I mean, they've had some touchdown potential, but some dropped passes, missed tackles, not being able to get off the field. And again, Joe Flacco starting, which I still don't get for life. I mean, why you're doing that? I know why, but it, you know what? You want to win games here. You know, this is a solid second year now. You want to start seeing some production. And you know what? You've got to go with the better option, and that's Mike White. And I get that it's a short sample size with White, but let's be honest. You look at it. I mean, it was against the Cincinnati Bengals, who were the AFC, who were, ended up being the AFC champions. It was against the, uh, the Colts. It was against, you know, teams that actually were pretty well. And you know what? See what you've got, because if Mike White plays well enough, and then you have Zach Wilson coming back, then you could actually get some trade value out of Mike White. And, you know, to be fair, the Jets have gotten trade value out of lesser guys like Jamal Adams and Sam Darnold. So I don't get I don't get why. And we're going to get to Robert Sala in a little bit because I don't know what the heck he's doing over there at Florham Park. But, yeah, not one of the uglier games of the week, the uh, Ravens getting past the Jets there 24-9. to Also, to close out the early window, the Commanders – come back late against the Jaguars 28 to 22. I had a good hunch that, it, you know, Jacksonville, they're an improved team. I now like the Lions. I mean, I think they're going to be better. They're going to get a few more wins this year, but they had chances to really put this game away. They were up late, but Carson Wentz drives down the field. And that's why, you know, the commanders are better at quarterback with Carson Wentz than they were under Taylor Heineke. Everybody wants to just point to that week 18 game last year, but Carson Wentz able to get them down the field Nice comeback. The problem you have, Trevor Lawrence, he's still a young kid. And I think sometimes he still tries to make moves that he did at Clemson that just don't work in the NFL. That's that's really what it is. But I think Jacksonville will get a few extra wins as the season goes on. But a nice comeback there for the commanders. And, you know, that NFC least 3-1 and one after week one. And 
Hank, then that gets us to the late window, and that gets us into our New York football giants <laughs> in an unbelievable game as they come back 21-20 to against the Tennessee Titans. And this was a game of two halves of up and down roller coaster emotions, roller coaster emotions. And one of the reasons why I don't have much of a voice here as we talk today, what a crazy game. Oh, my gosh. That was one of those games that – I have not seen from the New York Giants in a very long time. I mean, if you looked at like the first half and saw all the stats, like I think Daniel Jones at that point only had like what 59 yards. Saquon Barkley was getting stuffed a lot. 13 nothing with all those stats. In years past, I would have probably kept on watching, but assumed it would have been a loss. But you know, as Lee Corso from ESPN would say this week, not so fast, my friend. The Giants ended up coming, finding a way to tie it at 13. And I'm like, wow, they're showing fight. And that's something you have not seen from the Giants. I know I'm kind of repeating myself here in a very long time. But in my opinion, I think the reason that they did this was because, number one, Brian Dable, and look, you and I kind of had this discussion. I don't really like jumping the gun with Giants coaches and quarterbacks after like the first game, but so far, it looks to me like I'm gonna get I'm getting a different feel from Brian Dable as opposed to say the Joe Judges and the Pat Shermers and the well, that idiot who looked like a pizza guy whose name I don't really want to mention, the guy who benched Eli Manning. Yeah. He made some key adjustments and it helped for the Giants to, you know, score those touchdowns and tie the game. Now, unfortunately, there was one moment where, you know, they weren't able to get the PAT. But at the same time, you had the Titans bouncing back after the Giants t- touchdown. They end up taking the lead. And, you know, I have to say, Brian Dable in his debut. He outcoached Mike Vrabel, who Tom and I, if you watched our episode of Big Blue Avenue, Tom praised Mike Vrabel as being one of the better coaches in the NFL. Although, to be fair, I don't know whether that was necessarily a Mike Vrabel mistake or whether it was a or whether it was Todd Downing, the offensive coordinator, who was the reason for the Titans losing this. Because after, you know, Daniel Jones has that pick in the end zone. The Giants are driving. They're tying the game. It would have been a debilitating loss for the Giants any other year. Titans get the ball back. But yet, what surprised me was on third and one, the Titans tried to get fancy and have a little pass their tight end when, you know, and I'm going to use a family guy reference here. You have a big boat in Derrick Henry or a mystery box in the trick play with, with the tight end. As I just said, the Titans took the mystery box. Yeah. And that was a game changer because let's say the Titans get that first down. That's probably a good amount of time that's going to get chewed off the clock. And, you know, maybe they'll find other ways to use Derrick Henry to keep on running. And, you know, maybe the Giants don't have as much time to, you know, score and and maybe even the Titans score. But no, they give the Giants essentially a second chance to win the game and, you could argue that maybe it was it was an aptitude on the ta- on the Titans part with the play calling, or you could argue it was them being arrogant. But whatever it is, the Giants, you know, they had they started it at their own twenty seven yard line. They went seventy three yards, and that whole drive ended with a big touchdown from Daniel Jones to tight end Chris Myrick, and then they went with the two point conversion. Now I want to talk a little bit about this. Yes. I love that Brian Dable went for the two point conversion Great, because to me, it sends a message. I know it may be week one in the first game of the season, but to me, it sends a message that you believe in your team. It sends a message that you're willing to get aggressive. And look, I hate to sound like, you know, I hate to be critical of like a lot of what the giants have done, even though like I probably should be quite frankly, Look at a lot of coaching decisions the Giants have made within the past like half decade. How many decision how many of these decisions have you seen Joe Judge make that hasn't that have been like very passive aggressive or too afraid to lose? Yeah. You know, I'll I'll take it a step further. 
how many Giants head coaches would have went up to Daniel Jones after he threw that interception in the end zone on a terrible oh, back fade? Glad you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, that that to me, I think, ter- was one of the turning points also. First of all, that was a terrible throw by Daniel Jones throwing a back fade in the end zone there, yeah. which was just terrible. But And why would you even throw that to Saquon Barkley? Don't you yeah, have Ken Galladay or know, other A back fade in the end zone to a running back makes absolutely no sense. I mean, that's just... Again, that's just part of the roller coaster emotions that you had to just with the Giants in this game, you know, between you know, because Jones showed you some good moments and he showed you some moments that just make you want to do this. But yeah. I mean I like how you made the Kevin McAllister face, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just how it is. And I love the fact that the the Fox broadcast pans to the sideline and you see uh and you see Brian Dable going up to him saying, like, what the heck are you doing? I think the only other coach that I could think about that would have done something like that would have been Tom Coughlin. And so Mm -hmm. that to me, when I saw that moment, I was like, all right, cool. I already love Dable right there because he's, he's looking at him. He's holding him accountable. So there's that. Uh, Yeah. I love the going for two. And I, and I tweeted this out at at the time I said, go for two, because just with the history of the giants, first off, the way that Sunday was going with all the missed PATs and missed field goals, it's like, what's the difference if you tie it up there? You know, you, you know that the Titans are going to go down the field and you gave them a lot of time. But I also want to mention something that Tom said on um, on his recap on the Big Blue Avenue YouTube channel. He specifically said, if you're at home, then it's okay to play for the tie. But if you're on the road week one, you want to make a statement and go for the win. And I completely agree with him in that standpoint. So absolutely. He's 100 percent right on that. And look, the Titans at the end of the day. The Titans probably had a lot of opportunities to steal that game too, much like another game we're going to talk about with regards to the Denver Broncos. Like, yeah. if the Giants had lost that game, I probably would have been pissed because of all the penalties they took, giving Tennessee, you know, an opportunity to win the game. But we're probably, I'm probably still going to have this discussion with you about Hart and how much different they looked as compared to like weeks past and. Yeah. You'd like to think that with time, some of those penalties can be correctable, but that's something that I definitely do not want to see going forward the rest of the season. But I do want to mention this, though, speaking of coaching. That was some of the worst play calling I've seen from Mike Vrabel. Like, yeah. not just the the fade to the tight end that I was telling you about on third and one, when you could have just rushed with Derrick Henry and ate up some more clock. You also had a moment where I believe the second the second to last play you're at the Giants 29 yard line why don't you like attempt a shot at like you know going deep in the end zone when you're when you were in field goal range like wouldn't you want to try to like make it easier for a kicker and then there was a moment where they ended up having to take a timeout because they weren't looking at the play clock and you know that gave the Giants a lot more time to be prepared for that field goal yep yeah and yeah, there. That I, part of I watched that also, and I just I look at that game, and to me, it's why I think the Titans are not that good of a football team. I mean, they've got yeah. I, I know they've got Derrick Henry. They don't really have much else there mm-hmm. because they could have really taken taken this game and taken off in the first half. But as far as like the Giants go here, because I, they, you have to give some credit to them too. Obviously, making because here's another thing. Let me go back to Dable for a second here too. Another thing that he's that why I, I already like him and why I think he's better than some of the coaches they've already had. They made adjustments in the second half, you know, yes. that's, you know, the coaches in the past, you know, the names you've mentioned, they don't make those adjustments, but Dable made adjustments. The giants were able to capitalize on them, even with the, the terrible uh, interception in the end zone there. And let's also give credit to the offensive line. You know, let's give credit, credit to Evan Neal to Andrew oh my Thomas, gosh. who Evan were Neal and Andrew give, Thomas were Pancake yeah, and guys left they and helped, right. That's what helped Saquon Barkley get all of his all of his yards. Great run protection. So the, already something you've seen from years past. And Saquon looked like the Barkley of years ago, and you gotta love that. And I think that starts with the line giving opening him up and giving him protection. So already, again, it's only one week, but you already see things that you like from this team that you haven't seen in the last couple of years. And look, I just want to make something very clear to those who are watching. You and I are not going out there and declaring the Giants a playoff team. And look, if I'm being honest with you, my opinions on the Giants really haven't changed much despite the win. However, with that being said, you and I also predicted that this would be a closer game than people would realize. And 
I think taking the Giants against the Titans five and a half point like favorite spread, like I think that was one of the wiser decisions that we could have made. And I think you, I knew that we were going to be seeing something different. But like I said, I'm I'm not going to go far. I'm going to pump my foot on the brakes because this still this team still has a bit of work to be done. But I like the direction that they're going to. One and zero is a start, and as we said, it's something that has not happened since. Well, actually, it hasn't even happened since President Obama was still in office. That's the crazy yeah. part. Well, the thing is, I'm not going to sit here even a couple of days after the game and apologize for the fact that the Giants won this game. You know, you, a win's no. a win. And, and you, think like, about all the games we lost the other way around. That well, we and I was won. bracing for that when the, when the Titans were driving down the field and the Giants take two defensive penalties on third down twice on that last drive, and they are putting the Titans into possible field goal range. And you know what? We may have gotten lucky, but damn it, you know what? Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And it's about time that the Giants actually caught a break for once. But they definitely showed you some things that you like. And also at the same time, the Titans to me are not that good of a football team. I mean, I, again, I know they got Derrick Henry, but they have no offensive line, that which is going to affect Ryan Tannehill's production. Part of the reason why Tannehill's production has gone down is because that line is in shambles. They lost A.J. Brown. They have no weapons whatsoever because they had a chance to put this game away early, and they could not do it. I think if you were a Giants fan, as frustrated as you were in that first half to only be down two scores, you actually felt like, all right, you know, let's see what we can do in the second half here. And that's where you give kudos to Brian Dable for making adjustments in the second half, for, mm-hmm. you know, going for that moment where you see him at Daniel Jones, you know, screaming and saying, why are you throwing that terrible fade in the end zone to a running back? But then also at the same time, making that play call when they go down and score the touchdown and go for two to go for the for the lead, you know what? You gotta be you you've gotta be excited. And I Hank, you look at it now, these next three games, I know it sounds crazy, but you've got now the Panthers who are coming off that bad loss. You've got a Dakless Dallas team at home at MetLife Stadium, and you've got the Chicago Bears. So all of a sudden now things start to become kind of interesting in Giant Land for the next three weeks. You know, the the Panthers are kind of a wild card in all this. You know, is Baker going to bounce back? Christian McCaffrey, is he going to be able to go off? I don't know what the Carolina – I mean, I thought Carolina is an improved team, but as poorly as they played in the first half, that's a game they probably should have won down there in Carolina on Sunday. So we'll have to find out. All of a sudden, Sunday's game now against the Panthers, the giant home opener, becomes very interesting. And then after that, as like I said, you've got a Dakless Dallas team at home and the Chicago Bears. So things could be very, very interesting for the Giants here these first couple of weeks. But you know what? Enjoy week one. Let's celebrate it for a couple more days, and then we'll turn the calendar and we'll make our pick uh, as well as all of our picks for week two this coming Friday. Uh, real quick, other games in that late window. Kansas City gets past the um, Cardinals 44-21. See, to me, this was no, this was not even a doubt. Uh, oh, no. I... Crazy to think because of uh, Patrick Mahomes. I know he lost some guys on offense, you know, Tyreek Hill uh, in the offseason, defense – big question mark for the Chiefs, but you've still got the best, arguably the best quarterback, not only in football, but definitely that division, if not in all football, but Pat Mahomes has a, another great day. Uh, the, the Cardinals just, you know, not even, not only just missing uh, DeAndre Hopkins, but they're just, you know, not, not there yet for sure, but an easy win for Pat Mahomes there in Arizona for the Chiefs. And they'll turn right back around on Thursday and take on the Chargers, who got past the Raiders 24 to 19, but a kind of a costly win there as Keenan Allen, their wide receiver, uh, got left with a hamstring injury. And according to Tom Palazzaro over there at the NFL Network, he is unlikely to play this mm-hmm. upcoming week. A very quick turnaround for them against the Chiefs uh, Thursday night. But so the Chargers get a win there. So that AFC West goes two and two to start as the Chargers get past. And then also late window. Minnesota, bold statement here, and I like the Vikings in this game, and they got past the Packers 23-7. to Justin Jefferson, an awesome game. Uh, Kirk Cousins, you look at it, he had some moments where he stepped up in the pocket, made that night some couple deep throws, and how about the Packers' defense in this game? I mean, how wide open was Justin Jefferson on some of these throws, Hank? Oh, my gosh. He was absolutely phenomenal, and – Look, I definitely think the Minnesota Vikings were a team that improved. And whether I still think they're better than the Packers, I'm not 100% sure. But 
if you're a Viking fan, you have to love what you saw. I mean, holding them to seven points, I don't care whether that's home or away. That's a huge statement win for Minnesota. Like you, I never had a doubt in the Kansas City Chiefs. I knew they were going to absolutely pummel the Cardinals. And like what I saw out of Justin Herbert in that Chargers game, I, I'm sure you probably know this from having talked football with me, but I am a huge fan of that guy. And believe me, I yeah. wish he was a New York Giant, but that's a story for another day. And yeah. then, of course, we know there was the Dallas Cowboys yeah, team. We, we talked about that one. The yeah. only team, fun fact, that did not score a touchdown. I don't know. Maybe I'm being a jerk, but I just I can't help it. Nah, it's all good. I'm come back again and gloat about the Dallas Cowboys failures. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, and then quick. you had the last game that was the Seahawks and the Broncos. Now, I got to say, that was one of the strangest games I've ever seen. And look, if you thought that the coaching calls with Mike Vrabel and the calls with – um Oh, Zach Taylor were bad. Nathaniel Hackett made them look like geniuses. And somehow he made Pete Carroll still look competent. Yeah, for sure. And this game Monday night was so strange from the first, not even before kickoff twice. Number one, trying to get used to Joe Buck and Troy Aikman with ESPN microphones and calling a Monday night game, just strange. You Can know, I mention one on, takeaway and, that I like from Joe from Joe Buck, by the way? Yeah. I love that, like, you know, his first game with ESPN, he stops talking and he lets you hear the crowd as they're booing Russell Wilson. That yes, is a veteran move by any, any sportscaster. Like, I learned this in college. Sometimes less is more, and right away I can already tell the ESPN booth is going to be better. But that's just yeah. my little side tangent. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right, and – I like Buck and Aikman, but you know what's going to be the weird the weird test with them is mm-hmm. not every Monday night game is a marquee matchup, and it'll be very interesting when they call games that are not marquee matchups on Monday night. That's what's that's what we're, is going to be the, the test with them. But I think they're going to do just fine. Uh, I agree with you. I I watched that game Monday night, and I feel like that's the best booth ESPN's had in a very very long time. I mean, they've been juggling around guys for the longest time now, whether it was Sean McDonough, Steve Levy, uh, you know, Joe Tessitore. I mean, it, it, it's very difficult, you know, to when you keep juggling guys around here, but you've got, you know, legitimate capable guys in Buck and Aikman. I think they're going to do just fine. And yeah. How about, I, I couldn't believe the Seahawk fans booing Russell Wilson. I, 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 I it's not, it's, I couldn't believe that. That's like, if you, that's like Penguins fan, Penguin fans who booed Yarmir Yager when he came back on many occasions because, like, yeah. it makes no sense. Both of those guys were big reasons as to why their franchises were relevant and even won championships. So I think, if anything, they should be booing management and they should really be booing Pete Carroll because I've been on record for saying that Pete Carroll has really done a horrible job at building the Seahawks roster. And I'm I've slowly over the past few years started to think that maybe they should be moving on from him, whether it be in the coach, whether it be with coaching or whether it be as a GM, because I really, I'm, I'm of the belief that it's really hard for a GM to be to have like two hats as both the coach and in that position. But then again, I also am saying the same thing about Bill Belichick with the new England Patriots. And I think that's probably the reason why you and I are both not very high on that team, but yeah. Yeah. In, in any event, I would, definitely agree the, the, the idea that you're going to boo the best quarterback your franchise has ever had is, is very ridiculous yeah uh you know i mentioned in my pick segment on friday that the seahawks will steal or not steal but they'll win a game or two at home that they probably should not have won the broncos are more talented team but look you look at that game yes you give geno smith credit for the great first half that he had he really did, didn't do much in the second half but that but they were able to hold on and win to some questionable play calling there from the Daniel Hackett with the Broncos. You know, it's interesting because you look at, you go going into this year and some of the teams, their biggest question mark is head coach. I said that with the Broncos with the Daniel Hackett. I say that with the chargers with uh, Brandon Staley, but after week one, a lot of new coaches in different places and most of them won Dennis Allen, won with the saints, Todd Bowles with the, uh, with the Bucks, Brian Dable with the Giants, Matt Eberflus with the Bears, Mike McDaniel with the Dolphins, Kevin O'Connell with the 
Vikings all won. Josh McDaniels, Doug Peterson. Josh McDaniels with the Raiders. Doug Peterson with the Jaguars. Not as fortunate. Lovey Smith tied down there with Houston. And then Nathaniel Hackett lost with the, the Dolphins. So mostly a successful first week for a lot of new coaches in different places uh, there in the NFL. So well, let's we, talk about a coach that wasn't successful in Nathaniel Hackett. Yeah. A uh, lot, of, lot of question marks. I mean, that last drive, you – you trade for Russell Wilson, you give him all that money, and you're telling me that your field goal kicker, who has had a history of not making long kicks, that, that that long kick at the end is outside of his range, and you're basically telling me that he's better, a better option than uh, Russell Once Wilson. Once again, you could take the boat, which is the big uh, quarterback you made a splash for in the offseason, or you can select the mystery box to win the game. Take your pick. What do you think he selected? <laughs> yeah i'm sorry I, I just like i said it's my favorite family guy reference so this is what nathaniel hackett opted for instead of the 240 plus million dollars they gave russell wilson on fourth and five was that missed field goal and this was brandon mcmanus's career history on 62 plus yard field goals hat tip to warren sharp for this stat 62 yarder in 2016 miss 62 yarder in 2018 miss 63 yarder in 2021 miss 64 yarder in 2019 miss 64 yarder from monday night miss 70 yarder in 2021 miss so you're basically telling you that your field goal kicker who you're is kicking outside of his range is a better option than the quarterback that you traded everything and their kid brother for and extended him and you decided to go with that if i'm a broncos fan sitting here even a day or two later i'm still like blown to smithereens over that I mean, I'm ranting about it right now, and I'm not a Broncos fan. I'm kind of wearing Seahawk, all that alternate green uniform, showing my support for Geno Smith because you know what? I'm I'm happy for Geno. Look, Geno when he was that one game with the Giants. I mean, that's not his fault for what happened there. But you know, he's been out of the league for a long time. He hasn't really started in a long time since he was back with the Jets. But it was nice, cool to see him get an opportunity there. And look, big win for for the Seahawks out there on Monday night. Yeah, no, that was definitely one of the one of the crazier games. And week one always has a lot of those. Dump, it feels like, doesn't it? It's it's difficult because especially with a lot of these star players don't play much of any preseason. It's hard to put a gauge on them. That's why when we do our picks, it's week one's always the toughest one. I actually think it was kind of amazing that I went eight and eight in week one, especially considering that I at one point was two and seven. So I had to make a little rally just to get to 500. By the way, Hank, you did great. You did. A, you went 11 and five, and <laughs> and we will get our first pick of week two out of the way right now as we make that nice little transition to week two, which starts on Thursday night. Chargers and Chiefs at Arrowhead, first Thursday night football game on Amazon Prime. So our first chance to see Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreit together in the broadcast booth for a regular season game and Hank, the Kansas city chiefs are three and a half point favorites against the chargers. And it's not looking like as of right now that Keenan Allen for the chargers is going to, is going to play with that hamstring injury with a very quick turnaround. I mean, it could be, they're thinking it's not anything long-term. So he could be back on the 25th when they take on the Jaguars, but there's a couple of reasons why I'm going to take the Chiefs minus three and a half here. Number one, Patrick Mahomes never loses in September. Uh, I love the way that he played, uh, you know, basically exploited the the uh, the Cardinals there on Sunday. And I think this is a game, look, I took the Chargers to win the AFC West. This would be a bold statement if they were able to pull this off. I think they're going to split these two matchups. I think the Chiefs are going to win this one. I think the Chargers will win when it goes back to SoFi Stadium. But to me, I I just think the home field advantage here is a big deal. Now, I would like this if I was taking the Chiefs to get this one down to two and a half so you don't have to worry about that field goal late. But I do like Kansas City to come, come out of this one. Yeah, I I'm also leaning in that direction too because – I think to take it one step further, I don't think it's just that he's really good in games in September. He's also really good in games against his division. And, and you saw what happened in the game in Arizona. 
he is still a legitimate threat and still one of the very best quarterbacks in the league. And make no mistake, I love me some Justin Herbert, but I'm still I still haven't quite given up on the Kansas City Chiefs. In fact, I haven't even given up at all. I still have them finishing first in the division, but that's besides the point. Give me give me the Chiefs. Yeah, I just think you know, there's too much. I know the defense for the, is better on the Chargers side, but I think there's just too much plus the home field advantage here. I think it's going to play a big role in this one. So give me the Chiefs minus three and a half to start our week two picks against the spread. And again, Hank and I will be back on Friday for our full slate of week two games against the spread. So they come out every Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern here on the Empty the Bench podcast network and also on our social media accounts on Facebook.com slash Game on ETB, Twitter at Game on ETB, and on our YouTube channel, ETB Network. So that puts a wrap on the NFL. So let's get to some college football because opening week in the NFL was wild. This past weekend in college football, just as wild. Hank really starts at the top. Number one, Alabama barely squeaks past Texas 20 to 19. And, you know, it, and it almost looked like Texas was going to pull this off when they sacked, uh, when they sacked uh, the Alabama quarterback Bryce Young in the end zone there but they got called for a penalty. And look, here's what it comes down to, folks. That penalty, I mean, look, that's definitely a questionable call, but you cannot give Alabama second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth chances. I don't care who you are. They're going to exploit that. And Bryce Young made some unbelievable plays late. I think he showed you that, you know what, I'm in this discussion for a Heisman, for another Heisman uh, win this year with that unbelievable uh, late drive to get them in the field goal range and win the game late. Uh, and kudos to Texas for an unbelievable effort. It actually actually showed you that Alabama is kind of human in this regard, but they barely get past. But the, the bottom line is the lesson learned from this is you cannot give Nick Saban and Alabama second, third, or fourth chances. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. I Ben, you'd think people would have learned that lesson by now with him having coached them for 15 years and winning so many championships. But you know what though they played they played them tough and I think you know moral victory I think you got to give Texas a lot of credit because they they definitely could have shaken things up here for sure if they were able to pull that out but I think Alabama now who does not play this week you know it's a good lesson for them because you saw uh, at the end there I don't know if you saw the video but when uh, Saban's going to the at the end of the game shake hands I think one of the the uh, Crimson Tide players was putting the the Longhorns the thing down and and. Uh, going the other way and you heard you saw Saban say don't do that insert expletive uh as you want so night a big window for Bama I mean now because of the 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 fact that they had a tough time they switched with Georgia Georgia now the new number one uh uh, number one team in the AP top 25 poll but the poll definitely took a a a, got shaken up this week because number six Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher upset by App State and again, you know, Jimbo Fisher again, you know, he talks a big thing in the offseason, mm-hmm. but you know, can't get it done. And once again, it's App State doing it again. You know, they almost came back and beat North Carolina in that wild 63 to 61 game. And they do it again here on the road against Texas AM and shakes and has shaken things up. That is for sure. So AM's now out of it and App State doing it again. And then we get to arguably the most embarrassing moment of week two of college football. Ooh, I have a feeling it's going to be something related to your squad. Yeah. because Based on your green shirt, that's my guess. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have worn this for Notre Dame. This was really more for uh, the Seahawks and their alternate colors. But, yeah, Notre Dame just laid an absolute dud. I mean, I know their starting quarterback got hurt, and I know he's going to be out for the season, but still it's Marshall. I mean, you, 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 know, you play Ohio State extremely well and are in it for – almost all the game against the number two against the second best ranked team at the time in the country. And then you come home to take on Marshall. You're a 20 and a half point favorite and you lay an absolute dud. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, this I'm I'm out Saturday at a, at a summer party. We I'm following the game on and I just start getting very, very aggravated. And you can just tell in my voice, just how I just could not let it go. What happens? I mean, this was, arguably the worst loss that they've had in quite some time. Because you know what? I'll say this. And somewhere Brian Kelly, who has his own problems at LSU, you know, right now, 
Kelly would have probably got embarrassed against Ohio State, but I'll tell you right now, mm-hmm. he would not have lost this game. And no. all of a sudden, and Notre Dame should not be ranked. They're not ranked. You cannot lose to Marshall at home in your home opener like that. And the way you did, the final score, Hank, was not indicative of how the game was. They lost 26 to 21. It was not that close. Pick six there late. It's just an awful, awful feeling. And now Notre Dame, who we spoke about possibly being one of those teams that could get into the college football playoff, not happening. Forget college football playoff. I mean, you're not even going to be playing a New Year's Six Bowl game. And they may this may not be the end of it because they still got tough games down the road here. You know, they've still got to play Clemson later in the year. They got to take on USC. They got to take on North Carolina, who's not going to be an easy feat. That's why they had a chance here. If they were able to run the table, you could have a discussion for the college football playoff. That's gone now. Now, now you're just going to run the string out the rest of the year with Marcus Freeman. Now you've got to play with a backup quarterback. This is going to be a long, short season for the Fighting Irish, who did not put up any fight against Marshall. And you know what? One of the one of the positives for week two, give credit to the Sun Belt Conference because they had a great week. That that is for sure. But there's only one other guy and one other team that maybe have had had more of an embarrassing moment than Notre Dame this past week. We're gonna get to them in just a second. But not a good week for Notre Dame. And yeah, I'm not happy, as you can tell with my voice, it was a bad, bad Saturday there in Indiana. Hmm. Yeah, I was pretty surprised by that outcome. And are you still what, – what's your, what's your concern level at with uh, Marcus Freeman, though? I do want to ask you that before we want to move. Before we move. Uh, I, you know, it's tough because I don't know really how much this is on Marcus Freeman versus the, the talent that they have. And it, it's, it's tough to say. This is his first full year. I think it was very – he was put into a very, very tough spot last year when Brian Kelly bolted out at the end of the year last year. So, oh, and his I, Irish goodbye. Yeah, his, <laughs> yeah, his, exactly. His Irish goodbye. So, I'm not so sure. Really, it's more about Freeman versus the team itself. And now you don't have your starting quarterback for the rest of the season. We're, Hank, that might be a better question to ask as the weeks go on because you start getting, you know, you still got some pretty challenging games. I mean, everybody wants to say, "Oh, Notre Dame doesn't play anybody after the rest of the season." That's not true. They still play Clemson, who. By accident, it's the best team in the ACC, but that's at home. And you know what? You look at Clemson, their first game when they played against Georgia Tech, DJ didn't look that great. So their quarterback situation is not perfect there in, mm-hmm. at Clemson. You've got USC, who I think right now can make a run in the Pac-12. And you've got North Carolina, which is not a gimme. So they have some challenging games on the schedule this year, but we'll have to see. But, yeah, with Mar- I don't really know if it's Marcus Freeman more versus the team itself. Really, we'll find out in these in these coming weeks. Uh, really, for sure. But the the only team that probably had a worse well, I don't even know what to say. It's the worst day because it, well, because it, it's been such a bad stretch, and that's Nebraska, who fired Scott Frost after yet another one score loss. This one to Georgia Southern at home, forty five to forty two. And Hank, this is how desperate the. Cornhuskers were to get rid of Scott Frost. If he was still on the team in October, his buyout would have only been seven and a half million. Now it was fifteen million. To like get the severance pay. Yeah. But Frost went sixteen and thirty-one at Nebraska and five and twenty-two in one-score games. Remember. They had the first game, one, their first game of the season up there in Dublin against Northwestern, and they blew a, a double digit lead in the second half. Had a very, very questionable at best call with the onside kick there in the second half. And then you have a game where you lose to Georgia Southern. I mean, that's just the last straw there in Nebraska. I guess there's kind of pun intended with that, right? <laughs> with Cornhusker's <laughs> straw. Yeah. So. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so just so just a crazy week there with number six A and M losing, number eight Notre Dame losing in embarrassing fashion, and number one Alabama barely surviving. So because as a result of that, now you have the Georgia Bulldogs move up to number one, Bama down at number two, and again this upcoming week Thursday here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network and on Game Not a Game On, I will give you three more picks against the spread. We'll look ahead to week three. We'll look back at the second week as well. That comes up every Thursday. And I had, speaking of bad beats, I had some bad beats in there as well. But 
I seem to be doing all right in my college picks. We will get much more into that when that drops on Thursday. So you have college picks Thursday. You've got NFL picks Friday. And, of course, you've got game on here now. But, Hank, we're not done yet because – and I'm probably not done ranting yet because let's get to some baseball. Oh, mm-hmm. boy. This this one – this stuff that broke, and we knew this was going to happen. But it's now official. So and you'll then, be hearing this from me again later tonight on Hitting for the Cycle. Absolutely. Go check that out on uh, our buddies over there at Review and Preview. And uh, you may be familiar with our uh, guest tonight, too. Absolutely. Tune on that. Tune into that. That's coming up, what, at 8.30 tonight, right? Yes, we because at 7 we have uh, Pucking Around, the new NHL show that's going to be hosted by uh, Noah Dibler and Garth Michael Patrick. That's going to be a really good one that I cannot wait to see, but that's so – Double That's header there over at Review Preview day. Sports, and then Wednesday we've got the uh, twelve year the kickoff of year number twelve over there at Review Preview Sports. But here, mm-hmm. Hank, we get to these rule changes, and they're significant, and they're mostly not good. That's pretty yeah. much what it comes down to. So significant rule changes, including the pitch clock, banning of defensive shifts, they've been voted in, and. They will start in 20 to 23, and they're doing this to increase the game's pace, fasten the game's pace, and increase action. So here's what it comes down to. The league's competition committee, composed of six ownership-level representatives, four players of one umpire, approved of a pitch clock of 15 seconds with empty bases, 20 seconds with runners on, a defensive alignment that must include two fielders on each side of the second base bag with both feet on the dirt, as well as, as rules limiting pickoff moves, and expanding the size of the bases. So let's let's take this down a little little by little. Number one, the pitch clock to me, that I have no problem with. That was inevitable. I went to some minor league games down here in South Carolina this year to the Myrtle mm-hmm. Beach Pelicans, who were the low A affiliate of the Chicago Cubs, and I saw this pitch clock happen. I'm fine with it. You know what? That's that's something that baseball's been trying to do, but they never really enforced it. Now they're going to enforce it. So I'm fine with that one. Are okay. you fine with that? Yeah, no, not a problem. It, like, I mean, the idea of like having to like, you know, improve the pace of the play with pitches. I think that definitely makes sense, especially because you have some pitchers like take a long time in between. And I don't necessarily just mean former Mets pitcher Steve Traxel, but oh yeah, that's really where it started. Yes, yeah. So just I might to... as well call this the unofficial Steve Traxel rule. Oh yeah, there's. There's some more, but yeah, I think Steve, the Steve Traxel rule, I kind of like that one. So just to yeah. uh, further cl- uh, expand on this rule here, the catcher must be in position when the timer hits 10 seconds. The batter must have both feet in the batter's box and be, quote, alert at the eight-second mark, and the pitcher must start his, quote, motion to pitch by the expiration of the clock. And a violation by the ball by the pitcher is an automatic ball. One by the hitter can, constitutes an automatic strike. All right. You know what? We need to speed up the game. Games are taking way too long. That's fine. Again, pitch clock, that's inevitable. You know what? So I'm fine with that. But where do, where do I want to go here next? Uh, the, the banning the, of the shift. Uh, oh, let's, the yeah, let's get to this one. Let's it's get the to this one. one. All right. So this one, two fielders on each side of the second base bag with both feet on the dirt as well as uh, – well, okay. With each side of the second base bag, both feet on the dirt. I'm sorry. This this is a disgrace. You are telling you are telling me, or you're not telling me. You're telling teams they cannot play a certain defense on a team. I mean, come on. The NBA would never do something like this. The NFL would not do something like this. Hockey would not do something like this. I mean, why why are we telling a team that you must play defense this way? If they want an infielder to play either if you want a team to play three guys on the right side or the left side of the infield, or if you want some an infielder to play shallow right field, that should be their prerogative. And you know what? If we are if you're a hitter, you need to make adjustments and learn to get on base because that is your number one rule in baseball is not to hit a home run, it is to get on base. So go the other way. I feel like Joey Gallo, you know, a name that I know Yankee fans don't want to hear anymore. But I'm going to bring this name up in this regard because he has been very vocal about this. That he's had hits taken away. Joey, that's part of the game. Learn to bunt down the third base line. You've actually seen some guys do it this year. Get on base. You know, maybe your average would go up a little bit. Maybe your team would actually score some more runs. 
That's your job in baseball. It's to mm-hmm. get on base. All right. The fact you're telling me that you have that we have to alter a defense just to please the hitters. I'm sorry. It's garbage. That's it stupid. is utter garbage that we're doing. That this is happening. Oh, no, I, I absolutely I hate that. So, no, I am so aggravated over this because I cannot believe you're basically telling a team that they have to play defense a certain way because that's not going to limit strikeouts. That's not going to – I mean, it's going to help teams a little bit maybe, but if they guys go – if they, if you have a guy going out of the shallow right field robbing a hit, that's part of the game. I mean, come on. Why? why? Because players are complaining that – that they're getting hits taken away from them, that they're striking out. I mean, that's not because of the whole strikeout. Strikeouts are really a big issue, and that's not going to change the strikeout thing. I just don't get it. You would never, you would never see in the NFL a team tell that you cannot line up in a four three or three, you have to play in a three four or four three zone, or you tell me that a basketball team's got to play defense a certain while or hockey that they're going to eliminate the neutral zone trap. I'm sorry, this is utter. Garbage. And I can't really talk because I'm losing my voice, but I will I don't care if I lose it at the end of the show. Because this is terrible. This this rule right here in itself destroys the game. The game's already destroyed with everything that's happened, but this on top of it happens. I should if they're gonna give me the whole left side of the infield, well, you know what? I'm gonna learn to do that. And you know what? This is also shame on the hitting coaches and on the players and the teams themselves that don't that that don't tell their players, oh look, you have the whole left side. Go down that. Go the other way. Get on base. That's your job. Get on base, not to hit 490 foot solo home runs when your team's down five nothing. All right. Like I, like I've often said to you before, like, what do we need to see more of in in the game of baseball? Get them up. Get them on. Get them in. Get them up. Get them on. Get them over. Get them in. Yeah. Where is where has that been over the years? Like. I feel like that's become become foreign, like over the course of like, you know, a good amount of time. And I think you know what team I'm particularly yelling about, yelling at this about. This one, spoiler alert. So, yeah, no, it's ridiculous. And you know what they, you know what people often tell you about adapting or dying. If you adapt to the shift and find a way around it, guess what? They're gonna stop shifting. Ever think of that? They will. They will have changed. They would have done it manually, Hank. That's the thing. The that would, would be like away. in the NFL if you didn't allow teams to blitz and taking away a strategy, or if you wouldn't let teams play defense a certain way in the NBA. That's how ridiculous the banning of the shift. the The idea of banning the shift is. There, so, let's just take a look at this here. Um, the, the, the position of defensive players can be reviewed because, you know, that's that's another thing too. So the position of defensive players can be reviewed because that's the last thing that baseball needs is more stuff to be reviewed. Oh, we're, oh come on. So now we're, so wait a second. Me? So now we're just contradicting wait. ourselves because we're talking about trying to get the pace of play up, but now you teams can challenge and review a defense, uh, the band defensive style. What the fuck? Teams are going to be reviewed for shifts? The position Don't of defense. Don't we a bigger fish to fry than that? And if a defense is deemed illegal, the batting team can choose to accept the outcome of the play or take an automatic ball instead. Oh, an automatic ball. What? Oh, what? So if it's a three ball count, they'll get on base via the walk. That's such an anticlimactic way to like win a game. No. First of all, if there are men on base, they're not going to shift anyway. So if like the bases are loaded, they're not going to shift. So they're not going to have to worry about that. Uh, oh my God! I mean, this is just this is an absolute disgrace of a, of a rule. I, I said this that that's that is awful. All right, so we've got some, but wait, as they tell you on the infomercials, but wait, there is more. Oh, are you re- oh, you mean like the Billy Mays line? Yes, rest in peace, Billy Mays. By limiting disengagements with the mound, either with via pickoff move or step off, the rule hold accountable pitchers who would otherwise have a pitch clock work around there, likely to in- significantly increase stolen bases part of the action and will be intended to increase. 
And actually, so Whit Merrifield of the Blue Jays has been on record of saying stuff like this. Uh, there have been players that have been out there talking about these bigger bases and the pickoff rules that they are going to increase stolen bases. You know, I think part of the reason why you don't see many stolen bases in baseball, number one, there's not that many speedy players like there used to be. And number two, they don't get on base enough Two, look at, look at just the the way the game has changed in so many ways, but here's another one too. You don't have speedsters leading off anymore. Like you have guys, look, look at Yankees are a perfect example. That you'll see judge or Rizzo having. Uh, Yeah. Because they got on base. Now, that's another reason Aaron Judge is, you know, not to take anything away from his season, but look how many solo home runs he's got this year. And you know what? Maybe if the guys in front of him went against the shift and just got on base and changed their philosophy, Judge could have 150 RBIs right now, if you think about it. But pick off, step offs, reset the pitch clock. The rules would limit pitchers to two for each plate appearance. The number would reset if a runner advances. A pitcher can make a third pickoff attempt, but if it's unsuccessful, it will be a balk, allowing the runners to move up a base. Okay, again, I don't like this rule either. I I know that people don't like when they throw over three, four times in a bat. Again, that should be the pitcher's prerogative. That should not that should not be a problem. I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, what else do we've got here? Uh, so. Uh, bases will increase from 15 to 18 inches square with expectation that the larger size reduces collisions around the bag along with slightly shortening the distance between bases. See, I don't mind the bases increasing because if they're doing that to try and prevent injuries. But, yes, they are actually now going to shorten the distance between the bases. See, I thought they were also going to increase the bases because the umpiring has been so horrific that maybe it'll give them a better chance to get a call correctly. So... That's an interesting one because now the bases are shortening. Uh, additionally, teams will be granted an extra mound visit in the ninth inning if they have exhausted their five allotted visits. If a team still has visits remaining, it does not receive an extra one. Um, yeah, this is this is just an absolute. I'm sorry, these rule changes. I'm, I'm just going to be blatantly obvious. Uh, I'm just going to be blatantly obvious with this, folks. I'm going to make this very very simple. These rule changes just suck. All right. I'm sorry. There's some that are all right, but just the whole general philosophy of this idea just sucks. You know, the promotion of this game is awful. You know, you what? When you look what's going on in baseball this year. You have an, uh, just unbelievable moments happening, and I just don't feel like they're getting any recognition whatsoever. Uh, the game has changed. The lockout has now totally destroyed the sport, and now we're having rule changes that are going to affect next year. And this is what I had said when we started Game On, when we did when we did our baseball show coming out of the out of the uh, lockout. I had said this to people, and this is coming to fruition. The sport's damaged, but the worst of it, it has not even started yet. It's starting next year, and this is terrible. And you know who's at fault of this? Who it starts with? Uh, hold on. Let me get this uh, picture that I'm about to flash up on the screen ready for you. There he is right there. I'm so tired of talking about him. I really am. This it's, you know. Yep. There we go. <laughs> yeah. And he's probably when they are announcing this last week. See, I didn't see if he had a press conference after this, but he probably went up to the podium and he probably smiled. Just like he smiled when there was when there was a lot when the lockout was happening, he probably smiled at these rule changes because he thinks it's going to be so exciting. I don't know, folks. This sport that I grew up watching in the '90s, I know it was different even in the '80s and obviously well before that. But this game that I grew up watching in the '90s and early 2000s is not the same sport I'm watching today. And I should be, uh, you know, I should be watching this pen and chase. I mean, I'm watching this pen and chase stuff, but I just always had that feeling in the back of my mind about the lockout and now going into next year. You know, we, we should be celebrating the fact that we got some exciting moments. We got the Mets who are entering Tuesday, game and a half in front of the Braves in the NL East. We have the Yankees holding on to the AL East. We could be seeing these two teams on a collision course later in the year. You know, we've got the Dodgers who are the first team officially in the MLB postseason. We've got, uh, Albert Pujols making a run at 700 career home runs. We've got Mike Trout, who has hit a home run in seven consecutive games. He's one away from tying the record. Yeah. And I think it's appropriate. It's a home run last night, and the, and the, and the Angels lose. I mean, that just sums up the Angels. Oh, how fitting. Right? I mean, it's unbelievable. I think there's so a there are cool things happening in this game, but it's just. Is there just, a stat it, the Angels are losing despite Trout and Otani homering in the same game? 
and that's why I don't want to hear anything from Med fans telling me that the team's cursed and stuff. Because look at the Angels and what they, what's what's happening with them. They have Shohei Otani, unbelievable moment. Uh, Shohei Otani should be sh- should be one of the players of the year in any sport because of what he because of what he does. But you wouldn't really know about it unless you really were paying attention. Mike Trout's got 35 home runs in 100 games this year. If he was fully healthy, he almost be somebody to be talking about making a 50 or 60 home run kind of season. But yeah, uh, these rules, they suck. They suck the life out of this game. I'm sorry. It, this is not, these rule changes were not a good day for baseball on Friday. But we can celebrate the fact, Hank, that we're coming down the stretch of the baseball season and the Yankees are still holding on to first place. The Mets are a game and a half in front. You know, the Braves overtook them for a day, but the Mets came right back and won. Braves' terrible loss against the Mariners on Sunday. Another bad <laughs> loss against the Giants last night. Yep. And, so, and the Mets, though, the Mets, though, on the other hand, had a bad loss yesterday, too, against the Chicago Cubs. And, you know, there was an interesting, controversial decision that Buck Showalter made with two outs. He had runners on base. He could have pinch hit and had Mark Vientos make his debut instead of Darren Ruff. Now, keep in mind, before I, like, get into this decision, Darren Ruff has only had, like, one hit in his last 30-plus at-bats. So, pinch hitting for Mark Vientos, I think that would have made more sense, made sense, even if he's making his debut. However... I actually understand a bit why I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, I understand why Buck made that decision because I don't know if it's the, that's the best decision you want to, the best place you want to put a rookie making his, making his major league debut. Yeah. And keep in mind, I said that I, I lambasted Aaron Boone for putting up, for putting Peraza in down, not nothing. But then again, at least, at least if, if you made gave him his debut, it would have been in a clutch situation. You're putting, the other guy in a garbage time situation. But again, that's neither here nor there. I actually don't have as much of a problem. I think that issue was more of a Billy Epler thing. And I, I think I told you this too. I'm, I wasn't really all that satisfied with the improvements the Mets made at the trade deadline. So I don't really, I'm not really going to fault Buck, even though it does look bad hitting Darren Ruff, who's like been hitting, who's, been, who's really cool. And, and I'm going to be honest, I I'm not wasn't really a big fan of acquiring Darren Ruff to begin with either. Not to mention, I also think your other bench hitters, such as Vogelback, have been cooling. But that's again, that's another like side tangent. I could, I'll probably spare you that and save it for heading for the cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's going to come down. It's going to come down to the last week as far as the NL, NL East goes, and Mets have to win this division because you know we get to the wild card spot, anything's possible. That's that's the thing, but. And yeah, no, it because then if you have to play two out of three, then and you lose that first game, then it gets dicey. Well, yeah, and you also then have to use Degrom and Scherzer. Hopefully, if Scherzer comes back, which it looks like he's going to, you want to use them in earlier series, and then that kind of throws. And then even if you win, it kind of throws off your uh, pitching rotation for the following series. That's why I think the Mets can actually challenge the Dodgers if they could get Degrom and Scherzer in games one and two, because then you yeah. can use them for more games later on in the series. The Dodgers, to me, I know how great they are, but their pitching is still very, very suspect. I mean, they've had injury problems. That bullpen is not totally set in stone. So they definitely do have, you know, a way to get to them. But I think it starts with top-notch starting pitching, and the Mets have that, but they've got to get to the – they would have to, first off, they have to get there, and then they have to get there with DeGrom and Scherzer 1-2 so you can get the maximum value out of that because, you know, Walker's a, a wild card. Carrasco's a wild card. Uh, David Peterson's going to probably not be in the rotation in the postseason. He's going to be more of like a bullpen kind of option, that long reliever kind of. So uh, you've got to you've got to see what you're going to have there. Tre- uh, Tyler McGill looks like he's coming back, but he's coming back as a reliever. So it looks like you know that that's the way to do it. But the Braves are not going away, even with that bad loss on Sunday and then losing also to the Giants on Monday. They're not going away. This could be coming down to the end of the season. And the Yankees, to me, even with all the injury problems and the offensive woes they have, I still think they have just enough to get down the stretch and hold on. It's just going to be how healthy are they going to be heading into October? Because now it looks like we don't know if this Rizzo thing is just a 10-day stint. It does not look like the LeMahieu injury is just a 10-day stint, which I think is a major problem. That's the thing, too. It's not only the fact the Yankees are injured, Hank. It's who they have that's hurt. 
you know, Ben Attendi, contact lefty on base guy. LeMahieu, contact on base right handed second baseman. Anthony Rizzo, power hitting lefty first baseman who plays great defense, can help you out defensively. Yanks don't have other options at first base, really. I mean, you're throwing Marwin Gonzalez over there, or you're throwing maybe you throw Donaldson there. Donaldson's been terrible. I'm sorry. So even though the key options you have, I mean, they're not that great. Stanton, you, I mean, what is Stanton going to give you? And with all that, what ends up happening is that takes the bat out of judges' hands. Look how many intentional walks he's had in the last week or so. So it really affects the entire roster. You just hope these guys can come back healthy down the stretch and into October, and that's your best shot. And, yeah, definitely. But I will say this, though. That's why winning that series against the Tampa Bay Rays was all the more important because now let, let's do some math here. The Yankees have played, let's see, 85 plus 56. I believe that they have about like 30 something games left or, or 20 some games left. Sorry, my math isn't as good as I think it is, but in any event, I, or actually, no, they, I'm sorry. Let me, improve my malfunctioning math skills for a second <laughs> but I love numbers yeah no a5 plus that's 141 so they have 20 games left and they have yeah. a five and a half game game lead so the yankees now have better uh, are in better shape at winning the division now than they were before it even began they gained some ground on the Rays by taking that series and then the magic number actually shrunk down a game yesterday because the Blue Jays are actually playing the Rays. They're going to be beating each other up this week because yeah. they, and they actually have a double hundred today. So the magic number could be going down one way or another today if they, regardless of how that series goes. And if the Yankees take a game in Boston, which is very important because you have many, many series there, you have Garrett Cole pitching tonight and absolutely need this win. And then, Let's take a look at what the Yankees have left after this Red Sox series, because then they go to Milwaukee for three games, and then you have a two-game mini series against the Pirates, who, again, in theory, you would think that should be an easy win. Although we know that like anything can happen in baseball, so to me, there really is no such thing as that. And then yep. afterwards, you have a very important four-game series against the Red Sox. So this is pretty much your home stand coming up, and then you have the Blue Jays and the Orioles and the Rangers. So the Yankees just got through one of the more difficult parts of their schedule. So I actually think standing wise, they're in fine shape. But then again, we also said that about the Mets in 2007, when they were up by seven and a half game lead up, up by seven and a half games. And all they had on their schedule were series against the Marlins and the Nationals who were both battling each other for last place. So yeah. yeah, you know where I'm Never going. No, never know. That's for sure. But yeah, we'll uh, we'll find out. Like I said, I think the Yanks will be fine here for the rest of the season. They just need to get healthy and get some favorable matchups going into the postseason to see how deep of a run they can make. That's what's really going to be the thing. And then the other things you're going to watch here the rest of the season. You know, um, can Albert Pujols make a run at 700 home runs? He's at 697 as we uh, get into Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be close. That's something we'll watch there as well. Hank, there's one bit of breaking news regarding the NBA before we get out of here. Uh, this this broke here from Shams, mm -hmm. and uh, Woj has also been adding to it, and also uh, Baxter Holmes over there, senior base writer at ESPN. So the NBA suspended Suns owner Robert Sarver for one year from the Phoenix Suns and the Phoenix Mercury and fined him $10 million and to complete a training program. So among the key findings in this report um, – and this is coming from Baxter Holmes on Twitter, quote, Mr. Sarver on at least five occasions during his tenure with the Suns Mercury organization repeated the N word when recounting the statements of others. Also, there's details here of punishment for Sarver and additional requirements for the Suns and Mercury organization. Um, let's just see here because this is kind of broke. This kind of broke while we were on the air here. He engaged in instances of inequitable conduct towards uh, female employees made many sex related comments in the workplace, made inappropriate comments about the physical appearance of female employees and other women. And on several occasions engaged in inappropriate physical conduct towards male employees. 
And it says here, also, Sarver engaged in demeaning and harsh treatment of employees, including by yelling and cursing at them. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to break this down in real time here. Yeah, it's gross. I, I, I would look at all of that, and I'm, the first thing I think about is I don't think the penalty is harsh enough. I think it's got to be Oh, more. no. That's it's a just, slap in the wrist. Right? One year, $10 million. First of all, $10 million is chump change for these owners. I mean, so – yeah, I don't. I don't think the penalty is harsh enough. I think it's got to go more. And we've oh, seen. No. We've I mean, been no, taught no, that like, if you do things in the workplace like that, then you're then you'd get fired from your job. Like any other owner, anyone lower than him, and, and he's probably can't. No. Yeah, that's anybody else in the Suns or marketing organization. They're gone. Yeah. And this guy, all he gets is a one year suspension, and a slap on the wrist. Of like ten million dollars. Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna take it a step further th- further than you. I think he should be gone. Like, just make him ban him from the NBA, give him the Donald Sterling treatment, and then like you know, force him to like give up his ownership. Like, I'm sorry that that type of behavior in the workplace, like with your boss. And listen, I've heard, I know a lot of stories, and I I've heard of a lot of people having experiences where they've had to work for someone that's been treating them absolutely terribly. And, you know, more often than not, hopefully you hear about like the owner being held accountable, but there's been other moments where they like, they've like been allowed to get away with it. And this should be the same thing should apply in real life. I'm sorry. He shouldn't be allowed to own the Suns or the, or the Mercury for that matter. I mean, if you're, if you're going to make physical appearances of females and you're owning the a WNBA team, what what the fuck is wrong with you, Mr. Sarver? He's not. He cannot be present at any NBA or WNBA team facility. Uh, he can't participate or attend any event, including games, practices, business partner activity. Can't represent them in any public or private capacity. Have any involvement with the business or bur- or basketball operations. Uh, what else do we got here? He's got to complete a training program focused on respect and appropriate conduct in the workplace. And the $10 million fine is the maximum permitted by the NBA constitution and bylaws. So the $10 million fine, the money part of it is the maximum allowed. And he could be, I don't care. That's still not enough. Well, that's unfortunately something that's like collectively bargained and stuff. Like, so. I'm sorry, but that's still, that's still terrible. Well, the, the, the money fact, the money's not the issue. It's, I think it's the length. And I know now he's got to go through yeah. a whole complete training program. I mean, that's fine. But and me, I, I'm fine with the idea of him going through a training program, but my, my issue is my other issue is given how small the other punishments are, how do we even know he's going to learn that lesson? Well, they'll be they'll be monitoring it because you know this could be a two strike rule when it comes to stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the, the other thing too is this seems to be something that's talked uh, that we continue to hear and see and read about over and over again, whether it's player or owner or any sort of guy in any sport. Um, but yeah, now this is this is not a, a good sign. I mean, we've heard his name mentioned before, and the report, and this now finally comes out here on Tuesday about, about this, but yeah, no, there's just a lot, there's just a lot of gross things about this. I mean, the, the, I mean, just looking at our graphic right there, using, saying the N word at least five times when recounting statement of others, I mean, it's not criminal, but at the same time, that's just, I like, you know, any of us do that for any of our jobs, we're gone. It's not jail time, but I mean, we're gone from our jobs and that's, that's the thing. And Maybe something happens here down the road that maybe they can find a way to get him out. But that's – and look, this – I'm not going to compare this to James Dolan, but this is what I've always told my Nick fans who want Dolan out. It almost takes something like this to get him out, and you don't want that. No. So that's that's what I would say about that. But, yeah, the, unfortunately, just another problem with something like this. And so he's got a lot of work that he's got to do before he can get back to owning a team, and he should not even be allowed to own a team again. So – I understand the money angle. I'm not even going to talk about the money angle. I'm going to talk about the fact that he got a year. To me, that's not enough. But yeah, just a very, very. I mean, this report. If you read about it in full, and we'll put a we'll put a, a link to it on our social media pages, is just disgusting, pretty much. But 
that's uh, that's the way we're going to wrap up the show here today on this. So quite a bit of range of stuff going on, Hank, between, you know, the football, which is back in full force, which I'm excited about. You know, you and I could be happy for a few more days before we get into uh, Panthers and Giants on Sunday. Uh, we've got baseball coming down the stretch, you know, basketball almost starting up soon. Hockey's almost starting up soon. You know, I think training camps for hockey starting up. So we'll actually be mix, mixing some Rangers stuff into the course of the show here in the coming weeks before their uh, season starts up. Because before you know, that'll be here. So it's coming up fast. And uh, yes, folks, hopefully my voice will be better for next week. I'll tell you, this is all allergy related. I think you're all just going to have to deal with it for the next several weeks because that's uh, what's going on. But as far as our schedule here on Game On for this week, so. We just started finishing up episode 25 here. We've got uh, Monty Moment on week three of college football happening this upcoming Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We've got NFL picks against the spread coming up on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern here on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And then we'll be right back here again next week for episode 26. So, Hank, thanks so much. Go check out Hank. He will be our buddy Nick Morgison's going to be on with him on Hitting for the Cycle on Tuesday night. Uh, Hank, Tom, and our and Sam will be on uh, Big Blue Avenue. We want to check that out on Thursday nights. So that's with our buddies over there at Review and Preview Sports. So, Hank, thanks so much. I'll see you back here on Thursday for another Monty Moment. Hank and I will see you back here on Friday. And then for another episode of Game On next week. All right. <laughs>